What's going on, everybody? Zach Rosenblatt here with Mike K. The latest episode of the No Huddle Show. We're here at the Novacare Complex Playoff Edition Midweek Podcast. We're going to change things up a little bit today. Uh, we're going to get into some newsy stuff at the beginning, but then we're going to go into your comments and go into some of the tweets you guys sent me. I asked uh, if you guys think the Eagles are going to win against the Saints this week, and I got some really good answers. We're going to go through them and break down what you guys said. I'm excited to do that. We haven't really had a chance to do one of those yet this season, and we thought this was a good time to do it. But first, we'll talk about something that Doug Peterson said to us today. He he refused to say that Carson Wentz was out on Sunday, which I don't really understand what he gains by doing that because he's not going to be active on Sunday. Yeah, there, there's no way he's playing on Sunday, and so... Why are you playing with us, Doug? I, I mean, it's not what he said, it's more of what he didn't say, Yeah, exactly, right? yeah. So, That's uh, what he's been doing for the last month. He's like, every, somebody will ask, is Nick Foles going to be the quarterback the rest of the way? And he'll be like, uh, he's the quarterback this week. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it's interesting because when you look at this whole thing, you're playing with four cornerbacks. You you don't have the numbers in certain areas where you would like them. And if, if this three, you know, he was given a three-month timetable. It's not like he was, you know, oh, he's week to week. No, he is literally month to month, and you're kind of parading him out. I'm wondering if he wants to do that so that teams – down the road kind of prepare for him but like that doesn't really that doesn't make do anything, yeah, yeah i mean you you imi- immediately said nick was going to be the starter monday so what competitive advantage do you have i agree with you completely doesn't make a lot of sense i'm not sure it really helps matters but you've kept him on the active roster you're not putting him on ir um you know i don't know maybe it's it's a relationship thing that they're working on with wentz because he is the future of this franchise yeah i mean the the one scenario I'm curious how it would play out as if Nick suffered were to suffer like an injury and the Eagles won and they had a game next week and Nick couldn't go. I wonder if Carson Wentz is the guy they would start or if they would go, you know, Nate Sudfeld and they maybe keep Carson Wentz active as like an emergency backup. Like that's the one that's like the one like reason maybe I could like understand what they're how they're handling this. But it, it still just seems really weird. I mean, he was technically able to play through it during the Cowboys yeah. game and he finished strong. So He's not really hindered significantly he's, by he it. hasn't practiced right. Yeah. He just hasn't practiced. He's but however, however, earlier in the week, Peterson and Gro talked about his role in in this whole playoff run. He's been very supportive for Nick. He's been a backup quarterback essentially, pitching ideas, telling Nick what he sees, being a uh, presence at practice, and then also in the in the team meeting rooms. And that can be helpful because it's another perspective from a guy who has started pretty much as many games as Nick has over just the last few years. So Wentz's perspective is important. He's seemingly been very supportive and everybody in the locker room is, is clinging to Nick. And I think that that's what you want at this point in the season. Yeah. All right. That, that there wasn't really that much newsy to come out of the press conferences today besides that. So we'll, we'll get into your comments. I'll let Mike decide. Do you want to go YouTube first or Twitter first? Twitter. You know what? It's funny. Who's nicer? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, let's go with YouTube. YouTube. All right. These are the the old. These are quotes, uh, comments from after the game on Sunday from our post game pod. Some of these are longer. Uh, I'm going to try and get to all of them, but we probably won't be able to read all of them. First one comes from Sean Brooks. He says, what you guys are missing about Foles and why he's so calm and appreciative is that he's already faced his football mortality. He was ready to retire, to quit, to give it all up, and he had to come to grips with it. Then he got a new lease on life, so he brings that maturity and understanding to the players individually and the team collectively. That's why he fits into Peterson's. We just want to be 1-0 at the end of the game and why he's earned the respect of his coaches and teammates. The team respects Carson as an athlete, but they respect Nick as a man, and so they play hard for him. I mean, I don't really see anything to disagree with in there. Yeah, and I, I don't I, think it's that I, we... I, I don't, don't think we've missed it. We've yeah, said that, I feel like. Yeah, I think we've said that every other Come on, week. Sean. Yeah. Come on, Sean. <laughs> no, but we completely agree with you. I think... I do think Nick has perspective that other athletes and other quarterbacks don't have. And I think... His journey is remarkable. Right, yeah. And, you know, he's a guy that could retire at any point because you look at the career he's had, it's unrivaled. Um, and I think... It, Sean's exactly right. You bring this presence about you where I know something's bigger than football here. I understand that, well, this is a big pressure situation in my career. It's not a big pressure situation for my life. And I think that brings a sense of calmness to everyone. It gives other people perspective. It rubs off. And I think, yeah, I do think guys play hard for Nick. I, I do. I think that that's a legitimate thing. 
And I think Lane Johnson might have been the one I heard say it, or Kelsey or something, how they trusted in him last year, like you saw them rally around him, but because last year happened, it's almost like worked even better this year, weirdly, because they... It's, he's not just a typical backup. Like that's just the reality. So if Nick Foles is your, maybe if Nate Subfell comes in, I'm sure they would be confident in him. Everybody's talked really highly of him. But it's a different thing than Nick Foles, where you have this background with him, not not only from last year, but from his 2013, even 2014, before he started getting hurt. And they just these guys just all believe in him, and there's no reason not to. But do guys go to Sixers games with Nick Foles? That's my ultimate <laughs> True. question. Who was it that was with Nate, Cam uh, Alshon? Yeah, Nate. I thought it was Nate Sudfeld, wasn't it? No, Nate Sudfeld. That's how I meant. Yeah, Nate, I meant, yeah. Nate Sudfeld and Alshon <laughs> Jeffrey. What a pairing. Yeah. What a pairing. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, the next one, we got Ted Stranix. This one's pretty funny more than anything. He says, sometimes you got to wonder if God loves the Eagles more than any other team. He loves Nick Foles. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> We're not a religious podcast. This one is more uh, critical of us, but I thought we should say it. Uh, Marie DeBooth, whose comments on our YouTube videos a lot, and we appreciate that. She said, please stop talking over Michael K. There are points I wanted to hear his perspective on. Your jokes and laugh are not why people tune in, Zach. Throughout my whole life, I have people tell me about how annoying my laugh is, so you're not the first one to say that. But as for the talking over thing, I'm working on it. Mike and I have been trying to get myself better at that. My biggest takeaway from the comment, and Marie, I appreciate that you want to hear my perspective, is that you called me Michael K. Only my, gra- only my grandmother calls me Michael. So Michael? I, you know what? Clearly, we're payback from way back, and I appreciate uh, you sticking up for me because Zach is such a monster. But uh, I like to think you spelled my name wrong in your comment on purpose to despite me there, and I, and I understand why you did that. You know what? I'll allow it. <laughs> Michael will allow it. All right. Uh, I apologize if I pronounced your usernames wrong, by the way, guys, but this is from Vulpix Tricks. Tricks with a Z. Can you guys talk about how annoying it is when Chris Collingsworth does Eagles games? Because you can tell how much excitement he gets whenever Eagles make a mistake. He hates the Eagles. It's just weird. Um, maybe this is a hot take, but I, I don't hate Chris Collingsworth as much as everybody else does. I, 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 he says some things sometimes where you're like, all right, stop talking, Chris. But I, I think he, he brings some insight, and he's kind of the the – godfather of pro football focus so i don't know i he i can see why he's annoying and I, we don't watch the games while we're there we don't i mean we watch them. <laughs> we, we watch the games while we're there we don't watch them on tv while we're there so we don't really hear what he's saying but i don't know i don't mind him as much as like jason witten yeah i mean i think since he became the godfather of pro football focus it's been a little bit harder to, to listen to him but that said i do think the alternatives are yes much worse outside of maybe tony romo and uh, Nate Burleson. So again, you know, he's he's the guy that brings the uh, color to the, the the games. And I actually think he's, you know, I, I'm I'm indifferent to him pretty yeah. much. I do like the slide in. That's like my oh man, thing. Th- that video of the the bar just like going insane. It was like one of the best videos of the last year. <laughs> that cracked me up so much. <laughs> All right, we got Donovan Howard it says Nick Foles is a legend. No matter what happens from here on out. It was more than just a one-time run last season. He is special for that team. I'm not an Eagles fan in the slightest, but I love when a guy goes out there and earns the fans' respect over and over and over again, despite the doubters. It, it, it's interesting. I feel like Foles is one of the, those like universally liked guys around the like. There, there are fans from other teams who I don't, I don't see them saying bad things about him, and it's pretty rare that players get to that point. Like Drew Brees is another guy like that. Nobody ever says a bad thing about Drew Brees. And Nick Foles is interesting because he's not like we've talked about. He's never been a starter for a full season before. And like he, he's what I mean, at the beginning of the season, he was one of the top 10 best sold athletes in terms of memorabilia, not what uh, NFL players in terms of memorabilia. Like that's just remarkable. I think maybe I'll get some blowback for this, but I think there's a very Tim Tebow-esque aspect to him. You know, he's less polarizing. I would say less polarizing because I don't think he forces his, faith on yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ask him about it, he'll say yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, he'll talk about it. But I'm I'm not talking about the faith. Yeah, thing. yeah, I'm yeah. talking about being just an overall stand-up guy, very few flaws as a person. And those flaws that he does have, he's very open with. Um, he's a leader of, of guys, and I think guys gravitate towards him. I think those are attributes that Tebow had at the University of Florida in Denver as well. And I think Nick kind of, you know, his run and what he had to say after winning the Super Bowl kind of put him in a, a place where people could relate to him and also admire him. And I think Nick will carry that throughout his career. Yep, I agree. And so this next one made me laugh, and I brought it up to you. 
there was one point in the podcast where you said a word wrong like twice in a row and I like didn't want to cut you off. Maybe we could just flow right through it. But you said interpret instead of interpret and Daniel Tims was the one who pointed that out. He said interpret, LOL, I know it's a toughie, interpret. <laughs> That's just a, just a mic uh, brain fart. He has like one of those every now and then. <laughs> yeah, I, words no good. <laughs> words no good. He went to the Derek school, Zoolander school for kids who can't read good and want to do other stuff good too. <laughs> it was very tight. It felt like all my classmates were ants. <laughs> Oh, boy. All right. Uh, Cheapskate Coin says, I think an interesting subject for the podcast will be the state of special teams as a whole. This was directed at Mike, wasn't it? There, there have been a lot of missed kicks lately. Really good punters seem harder to come by, unless they're named Cameron Johnson. That's not in the comment. There's there's the change with the standing kickoff as well. I think there's a lot to look at there. Go, yeah. We can point this to your special teams spiel part of the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that later. But I, I agree with you. I think the kickoff has largely been taken out of the game. I mean, you look at what Boston Scott's been able to do. He had that nice 35 yard run, but outside of that, he's been pretty much useless. Uh, that's not fair. He, he hasn't been effective. And I think, you know, the punt is kind of getting there too. Um, you look at what happened with Cam Johnson, in this game that he had no returnable punts because of how good the special teams units were playing. Um, the influx of Aussie kickers has kind of helped that too, because they have such strong legs. Uh, and honestly, Dave Fipp coaches a really good punting unit. Um, so, Again, I, I agree with you. There's a lot going on here, and I think there's going to be a lot of big discussions in the off season about how the game is working with safety and special teams. And I think we'll probably discuss that a lot this off season. And, and one special teams uh, rule change that I think we're seeing the impact of was the uh, how you can't get a running start on off, on sides kicks. There's been a couple of them recently where they've had to try to get creative with it, and they just like there was the one what what the Ravens where they punted it like. Uh, <laughs> Or the Seahawks, sorry, the Seahawks, where they like had some weird punt, and I've never seen it. Like, but you have to like work around the rules because the running start was really big on those onside kicks. I think there was a stat: teams were like five for like fifty-five this season on onside kicks. It's not a high success rate anyway, but I mean that's especially in the postseason when games are close. That's that's like a plot line for sure. Drew Christensen asked, "I have a topic for you guys. Can we discuss the importance of interior pressure to disrupt Breeze? Is this the formula? Is this what the Cowboys' defense is able to do against the Saints?" I mean, I think 100% yes. So I've always subscribed to the idea of interior pressure is more <clears throat> valuable than exterior pressure because when you can get a, 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 a pocket passer, I mean, I, I'm not trying to marginalize Drew Brees. Drew Brees has got very good pocket mobility, but when you have a pocket passer, especially a short one, and you're able to take away the pocket from him because you're collapsing it from inside and he can't step up, yeah, that's going to force some bad throws. You've actually seen it with Nick Foles at times, where he's made a couple of his interceptions through the streak have been because he didn't have the pocket, the interior collapsed, and he made a bad throw. Fletcher Cox is the second best defensive tackle in the world, period. Okay, He's going to have to have a big game here. Now, he's probably going to go up against Max Unger and Andres Pete. I'm excited to see that matchup quite a bit. The guy that's really important in this game is is a man named Tim Jernigan. I was about to say Tim that. Tim Jernigan is going to benefit from the double teams that Fletcher Cox gets. He needs to take advantage. He had a sack against the Bears. I think that's going to be very important. And then when you see kind of a lightning package with Brandon Graham inside or or Michael Bennett inside, that's also going to help. I do agree with you that this is probably the key to stopping Drew Brees. They didn't really get a lot of pressure in this last game. Uh, <laughs> the first game, uh, I not. think Josh Sweat touched him once. At that point, Bennett wasn't like in his hot streak yet either. Yeah, and Cox had cooled down a little bit as well. So I think, yeah, the defensive lines played a lot better. As you saw, Pro Football Focus uh, had ranked the Eagles front seven as the top front seven in the league. I'm not sure I agree with that just because of the linebackers. But yeah. uh, Fletcher Cox is on a killer role. He was dominant against the Bears. He was dominant against Washington. He had a good game against Houston. Michael Bennett, when he's not creating stupid penalties from getting in arguments with Kyle Long, is great. a great player still. Chris Long, I think, could actually have a really good game in, in this one because I think he does a really good job of stunting. Um, you're going to want to have a bunch of stunts in this game. Uh, the wide nine is built to be able to accomplish that. I think the Eagles will have the advantage there. They have the better defensive line of the two teams. And while the Saints offensive line is pretty good, Fletcher Cox is better than everyone. <laughs> he's he's ridiculous. Another guy you didn't mention, 
who was kind of a hero of the last game, Trayvon Hester, who's played pretty well. He, he doesn't get as many snaps. It seems like Jernigan's finally like going upwards. He's I think he had the second most out of the de- defensive tackle group. Haloti not as good if he's in a limited role. Like he was only supposed to be the I mean in reality he should have only been supposed to be the third defensive tackle. They probably relied on him too much. But you kind of that was kind of like an underrated like problem area during the season where defensive tackle group is really thin and now you're they're kind of deep too. Yeah, they only really fielded three defensive tackles yeah. for like half the year. And Bruce and bounced back and forth. And, and that was yeah. something that I complained about openly. I was clearly wrong because uh, the guy that I was saying they should put on IR to get another defensive tackle was Darren Sproles, who has <laughs> lit it up as of late. Again, we were wrong. Yeah. We were wrong. This is our weekly... <laughs> weekly <laughs> admittance. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we do it bi-weekly. I don't, I, you know, I don't, whatever. Anyway. All right, we're, we're going to go on to Twitter now. It's a Twitter machine. All right, we got... At Mr. Whitworth said, I, this is from my question I asked, I posed on Twitter about whether, if you think the Saints can win and why or why not, or, or the Eagles can beat the Saints and why or why not. Mr. Whitworth said, yes, we can watch our last game to see what we did poorly and what they did well. I think he means like week 11. Uh, we can adapt. They can't because they can only watch what we were bad at. <laughs> Doug is great at making They can only watch what <laughs> That actually made me laugh. Um, I know. We, I, heard, we all heard it. I don't know. Podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how much like the actual game film from Week 11 will have a bearing necessarily on this game. I think the Eagles can like go to that to watch some of their tendencies, maybe. But you're more going to be watching what the Saints have done over the last five weeks, and even then, it's kind of tough because they didn't play that last week pretty much. Um, and, well, and they've cooled off. They've too. cooled off, so I don't, it's an interesting dynamic. And the Eagles coaches are they they have the right people to find the right film to watch. But I, I don't know how much emphasis there will actually be on what happened. Maybe what went wrong for the Eagles in that game they'll they'll focus on, but I don't know how much of an emphasis there's going to be there. Well, if you listen to Jim Schwartz, there'll be no emphasis. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I think that's a game that you kind of throw out. When a game's that lopsided, the, the, the one team is doing what they do well really, really well, which isn't the, the, the average, and the team that's failing is doing what they do poorly at an extensive rate. So I think, you know, you've got to figure out what I guess the mean is right. I mean, yeah. you, you've got to somewhere down the middle. Yeah, yeah. You've got to you've got to see. I, I think like if I were the Saints and I wanted to study the Eagles in like a, I would study the Colts game. Obviously, Carson Wentz started that. I would study the Texans game and I would study the Rams game because I think the Redskins game was just like a culmination of a bunch of great things happening. I thought the Bears the Bears defense is significantly better than the Saints. So I don't know if it really benefits you. They also play two different fronts. So I I don't know if it benefits you to watch that game. But, I mean, well, the Texans play a different front too. But I I think the Texans and the – the Texans, the Rams, and the Colts games, to me, are like the three games that I would really study where the offense is flowing, but it's not where it's, like, tremendous and they're kind of doing a a miraculous thing. It's – they're playing their game at their best, but – it, the other team is being competitive. Yeah, that's fair. All right, at Ariel underscore Ace One, the Saints are a well-coached team led by an all-time great QB playing with a huge home field advantage, but the Eagles have something going. Secondary and D-line need to play out of their minds to keep it close. Nick will have to match Breeze, and I don't know what happens, but Nick has magic. I, I agree with all that. It, it, the secondary, if they make any mistakes, like Drew Brees is, the, if there's any quarterback that's going to capitalize on them, it's him. You don't think Drew, Mitch, Mitchell Trubisky is not going to do that. That's just the reality. So, if those cornerbacks, you know, it's a different group than the one in Week 11, and the Saints have to study up on these guys because Razul Douglas and uh, Avante, Avante Maddox got hurt in the first quarter of that game, which people forget, so he pretty much didn't play in that game, and he's been their best playmaker probably in the secondary since then. So it's going to come down to those guys just not making mistakes. Maybe you don't have to play a perfect game, but you have to play pr- pretty close to it. Yeah, and I think um, for the Eagles – when you're looking at the Saints, you want to look at what the Cowboys were able to do to the Saints, right? And they force a lot of pressure. This game's going to come down to how the front seven reacts to the Saints' offense. I, th- I think that's really what it is, because if you can get pressure in Drew Brees' face, he can make mistakes. He had three interceptions, I believe, in his last four games. So, you know, this isn't a team that's not... But he only had five interceptions all season. Yeah. So... um this isn't a team that gives up the ball all that often. You're going to have to make big plays up front from a sack standpoint and a pressure standpoint if you are the Eagles' defense. Russell Douglas and Avante Maddox will give up plays. 
That happens. You've got to accept that. That said, if they can limit the yards after the catch, if they can limit the stuff in the red zone, then I think they're fine. Nick Foles has to hold on to the football. Or not hold on to the football. Not turn it over. Yeah, so, protect the football. He's he's had five interceptions in the four games since yeah, he's been back. not great. They've been able to overcome it, but this Eagles defense in the three prior games to the one against Chicago had forced repeated interceptions and turnovers and they were able to win the turnover battle or at least come close. If Nick Foles turns the ball over twice, they are not winning this turnover battle. The the odds of you winning games where you turn the ball over twice and the other team doesn't turn the ball over are really slim. Like they got they escaped the the Bears game because the defense capitalized on what they were what they were able to and you can't rely on that. You can't expect the defense to shut the other guys down and keep making those mistakes. And I mean, Nick understands that, obviously, but I think that that's definitely going to be something to watch. Um, at Greg S one nine eight one, I think the Eagles can win, but it's going to take a mistake free game from Foles, and the defense has to force a couple turnovers. I think the Eagles can score enough points to keep them in the game. I think if they can hold the Saints to under twenty four points, the Eagles win. I agree. If the Saints don't score twenty four points, the Eagles are winning that game. Well, here I don't mean to be the wet blanket on this one, but the Saints averaged 31.4 points per game during the season, and at home they averaged 34.1. So wow, that's crazy. Uh, you know, I, I, it's going to not be an it won't be an easy task. We know from going to the Superdome this year, it's an extremely yeah, tough place to play, it is. and when the Saints have a rhythm, they can explode. Uh, they're more likely to score 40 points than any other team in the league, and you know they are the best team in the NFC. So. I mean, they're, it, the Super Bowl, be they're probably the Super Bowl favorite right now. So, yeah, I would think so. All right, we got at K Will forty four. It'll be a close game. The regular season game doesn't matter. In fact, it only adds motivation for the Birds and makes the Saints overconfident. Probably going to come down to the last possession. Birds D playing out of their minds, and then he had three popcorn emojis in a row. So he got his popcorn ready. I like popcorn. <laughs> but uh, I don't. I I haven't decided what I, I'm going to predict on this game yet. If it comes down to the end, I mean that that's, I mean in the playoffs it's a win or it's a loss. But if you can keep the Saints game close and you get it down to the wire and you have a chance at winning it, then you can feel really good going in the offseason at the least. Yeah, I mean I think there's a lot you feel good about with right now. But yeah. Peterson has made it very clear. I wrote about this earlier. He said we've gotten to the dance. Now we've got to get as far as close as we can to the stage. And that to me sounds like, you know, they're not resting on their laurels. They they did say that they're playing with house money. Don't say that to Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson doesn't want to hear that. He wants to just, he wants to hit the, his second straight jackpot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's not as much of the no pressure talk that he was talking about earlier this season. Um, all right, let's see what we got. We got at Teddy. Sorry if I said this wrong. Sakor. I think Michael Thomas will be too much to handle. He thrives off the double move. And we saw what Allen Robinson did at Avante Maddox late in the fourth. Liked how Cone was bottled up, hoping the same for Kamara. That will be key. Um, yeah, Michael Thomas is a big concern, but I I, I view that as like like we've talked about how they defended Julio Jones earlier in the season, where they allowed him to get 150 yards on 12 catches, but he didn't score a touchdown and he didn't get any huge plays. You can you can kind of do the same thing with Michael Thomas. He's a similarly skilled receiver, probably. He he might be the best receiver in the NFL. He has a, a case as a top three at the least. Um, the well, co- and you know he, they're going to go to him a lot. Yeah. He led the league in, in catches. He's a guy that if. Drew Brees is pressured, he's going to go to him, which gives you an opportunity if you have a safety to kind of key in on, on Thomas. And I don't think their other receivers are – I mean, Drew Brees makes their other guys look better than they actually are. They had some random dudes scoring touchdowns against the Eagles that day. Um, but the, the Alvin Kamara thing, you know, the Eagles did a great job of shutting down Tariqo, and I, I think part of that was the Bears weren't going to him as much as they probably should, which was a strange decision. They should The Bears should have ran the ball a lot more than they did. But between – I think Jim Schwartz credited uh, – Malcolm Jenkins, and Nigel Bradham. Nigel Bradham, and he also said Craven LeBlanc too, actually. And those will be the guys that will be trying to shut down Kamara too. I'm sure Malcolm will be eyeing him when he's in the game, when it's in Grim Hill, play his traditional linebacker safety hybrid role. But they're cap- they're able to stop guys like that because of Malcolm Jenkins. Like that's just three. Like the way he can play as many different positions as you need him to on the defense, and he can shadow a guy, he can blitz, he can play back, like. That matchup is going to be something we're going to have our eye on, and it, they didn't really stop him that well in that first game, but they didn't stop anyone well in that first game. Yeah, uh, sorry, <laughs> my, mic, uh, my mic was not working. Your mic, Mike. Um, hey, you didn't want to hear loud breathing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Mike Thomas to me is a guy that 
if he's the only guy beating you, the Saints probably aren't winning that game. If you can make the the Saints really one dimensional, which I think they can, um, you've got a shot. Yeah. All right. At Instigator Z eight eight nine. Unfortunately, Saints. He's saying they're going to win. Uh, they play great. Breeze never lost a playoff game there. Most of all our D slash secondary and linebackers in particular struggle mightily with quarterbacks that read defenses and get the ball out quick. It would be the biggest Eagles upset of all time. IMO. Hmm. I don't know about that, but I, I, I mean, I, look, it's different in the playoffs. You've got a team with a ton of playoff experience. I don't think this is going to be as lopsided. I, I, I think the Saints will win this game. I'll come out right and say it, but I do think it's going to be a lot closer than, than most yeah, yeah. of the national media. Wants well, the thing you said about quarterbacks in the ball, which quarterbacks have they played that get the ball out that quickly? I'm trying to even think, because I know Deshaun Watson kind of makes things happen later in the in the clock. Uh, the Rams tried to get it out quickly with the golf, but it wasn't really working that day. Um, I'm trying to think. Of the, I mean, Breeze destroyed them, obviously. Kirk Cousins. Kirk, Kirk Cousins, Cousins got the ball out quickly. He played pretty well uh, against them. Down the stretch, uh, Cam Newton did. Marcus Mariota did. Okay, uh, so that's you fair. know, I think I the think, early struggles you could, you could yeah, look at. yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, at <laughs> at subtle monkey, no, because the NFL loves Breeze and won't allow him to lose in the Superdome. So we got a conspiracy theorist here. <laughs> All right, at Brockstar ninety one, yes, I think the Eagles have the better matchup for both the offensive and defensive line. The Saints definitely have an advantage at offensive skill positions, but Eagles lines have been dominant for the past several weeks. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're a believer that if you win the trenches, you're going to win the game, the Eagles probably do have the upside in that in that arena. I mean, Cameron Jordan's very good. Their offensive line is very good. But pound for pound, I would say the Eagles I, – I think the offensive lines are kind of a push. Yeah, the Saints' or, offensive or line even. is really good. But um, the defensive line is definitely better for the Eagles. Yeah. All right, we got at the Johnny Mop. No, because as we learned last year, the buy and home field together is important, maybe most important, but it'll be a much more competitive game coming down to a late defensive stand by the Saints. Um, he's right. Like the, buy, the the week off and the buy, and the home field advantage is obviously huge, especially when you have the crowd the Saints have. But I think like an underrated factor that people aren't maybe talking about as much is that the Saints haven't pl- played in two weeks. Drew, they haven't played their starters pretty much in three weeks. Breeze didn't play in week seventeen. And they were, like you said, they were a little rusty at the end of the season. So I'm curious to see what kind of, how they look at the beginning of that game. I think we'll know pretty quickly what kind of Saints they're dealing with. If the Saints come out slow, then I agree it's going to come down to the end. If the Saints come out and score first and the Eagles are playing from behind, it, it could get out of hand. Yeah, the Eagles have to control the clock. They have to be able to run the football very well, and they have to be able to start off fast. You can't settle for field goals against this team. Field goals are not going to cut it. Um, but I agree, yeah, I think it'll come down to the wire. All right, we got at Hashzilla. Uh, I don't think Drew Brees has been as sharp as he was midseason. Possibly longer seasons can wear on a man of his age. <laughs> Just making fun of an old man. That's not cool. Uh, at Mike Shemesh, Shemesh, the Eagles can win if they protect foals, minimize mistakes, and capitalize the touchdowns on scoring drives. Hashtag analysis. Uh, Brees is less likely to leave points off the board, so no drive killing interceptions or defense dropping interceptions also helps. We've talked about pretty much all that, but defense dropping interceptions thing. I mean, that's kind of like a low-key good point because they've dealt with that quite a few times this year, and it ha- didn't really come back to bite them at all, maybe besides the Camus Grugier Hill one against the Cowboys that first time. But Trey Sullivan dropped one last week. Nigel Bradham has, is famous for dropping them. They can't have that. You can't give away easy turnovers. Um, at Donald C 58 they have a chance. As a betting person, I would take the points. As to pick the game, I would take the Saints. Drew Brees is a great quarterback, and I'm not completely convinced that our defense will be able to stop him. That's all fair. I think the line was eight points the last time I checked. I'd, I'd give, I'd do Eagles plus eight. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think th- this is going to be a three to four point game. Yeah. At K Sir this six, the Eagles will win for no other reason than Nick Foles possesses some unexplained magic. There isn't any logic to how he makes the team play and how every guy in the roster rallies behind him. <laughs> I'm not going to say the last part of that tweet. Um, <laughs> you guys can probably guess what it's about. Uh, <laughs> but what was I going to say? Um, I mean, yeah, so the reality is the Saints have a better roster. They're probably the more talented team. And the only reason anybody's picking the Eagles is because they have that intangible and they have the Nick Foles thing. And you're just, you're just banking on that continuing and not betting against Foles. But the reality is there's there's no reason to bet against the Saints other than the fact that the Fo- Eagle, Eagles have the Foles factor. Yeah, and I mean, you know, previous history of being underdogs and so yeah, on yeah. and so forth. Yeah, I mean, but that's something. It's all like intangible stuff. It's not like right, on-field right. stuff necessarily. Right, I agree. It's... uh 
you know, he's got a lot of intangibles. <laughs> All right. Uh, at M-D-I-N-G Philly, uh, number one, Eagles are at their lowest point and Saints at their peak in week 11. Number two, Eagles offensive defensive lines are healthy and rolling. Number three, Tate, Golden Tate is now a factor in the offense. Number four, hard to beat teams twice. Number five, Kamara and Ingram calling Eagles fraudulent champs and running up the scoreboard in, ex- in all capital letters, yes. He makes a, these are all good points. The, the Saints were certainly haven't played the same way as they did that week since then. The Eagles have played their best. Uh, we already talked about the Lions. Golden Tate, I'm sure we'll talk about it more in our preview podcast, but he – if they're using him the way they did the other day, then he's certainly a factor in this game. It is hard to beat teams twice. Uh, I mean, but you kind of just have to throw everything out of the window when, when you get to the playoffs anyway. The Kamara Ingram, the trash talk thing is kind of like an underlying theme, I think, this week. The Eagles players, some of them have, Jason Peters especially has admitted, like, they, they, they ran up the score that last game. Doug refused to say that. I mean, it seemed pretty obvious they kind of were doing that. I don't think maybe the coach staff here really cares about that. I'm sure they'll use that as a motive at any point. Like, they didn't respect you enough to to just play it out, and they, they, those dudes were dancing on the sideline. The fraudulent thing he's talking about, uh, Mark Ingram kind of subtly jabbed at Not so subtly. I guess everybody knew what he was doing. He, they started the ski mask thing. They were doing it before the Eagles were. I don't know if the Eagles got that idea from them, but he referred to people doing the ski mask thing as fraudulence, which is a shot at them. And then before the season, Alvin Kamara said that the Eagles would have beat the bleep out of the Eagles in the playoffs last the year. The Saints would have beat the bleep. Saints would have yeah. beat the bleep out of the. But instead, they lost the Vikings. So. <laughs> I actually would have paid to see like a Madden style like Eagles versus Eagles who would <laughs> who would beat the Eagles yeah. between the Eagles and the Eagles yeah I mean I mean if they were wearing their all white uniform this year it would be the all white uniform team yeah whoever was in the all white um, what I will say to that is yeah I think I don't believe in bulletin board material yeah, and I yeah. know a lot of players that don't I think yeah yeah I think uh, it's overblown for sure it's overblown I do, it's just it's more of like a fun week up thing I do think the Saints would have been a bad matchup for the Eagles last year that said what happened happened. Yeah. They they're clear if if Would've, they could have shoulda. Right. They made they've made the playoffs, won a playoff game in their second year as cha- in their follow-up year as champions. They're no longer con- should be considered fraudulent. This team clearly has a very good coaching staff, a very good slew of depth and Nick Foles is banana pants, kind of. Um, I'm sure th- I shouldn't have said that. I'm sure someone's going to take that another oh way. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it, look, this team is very talented. They deserve to be here after the four game winning streak they've been on. And you know what? Maybe it'll extend to five. All right, let's see. Let's skip ahead a little bit here because we're running long. All right, we got at Zip Squad underscore Jihad. He said, yes, I think the defensive backfield isn't a bunch of substitute PE teachers pulled off the street. <laughs> I think Schwartz will present different looks to the Saints offense. The offensive line is also healthy, 27-24 Eagles. I mean, that we've mentioned it a few times. We'll probably mention it again on Friday. Like, the players they were putting out there in Week 11 like just weren't ready. LeBlanc had been on the team. I think that was the week he joined, right? Or maybe the uh, yeah. week after. Devontae Bosby and Shannon Sullivan received the bulk of the snaps after Maddox went down. I think Douglas was in that game. I don't know how much he played. He, no, he wasn't playing safety uh, that game. He, but. he played in the game, but he was injured during the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was one of the he like because he got he missed like the week after that or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean that. The, oh no, well, he he played. He just missed all practice, I believe. Is yeah, what it was. It, but it, um, it was he was hurt. Yeah. yeah, he was hurt. Um, I will agree with that. They are not. Uh, They're not substitute comes, PE teachers off the street. You know what? <laughs> is but, that the shot of DeAndre Carter? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, whatever. I got nothing. <laughs> that, Never mind. that was funny. That made me laugh. As you guys heard. <laughs> um, let's see, we'll end on this one. At number two, All Ender. I think they have a lot of motivation with some of the bulletin board material. They have an actual secondary now. A lot of shots at Devontae Bosby today. And a lot of players are playing their best ball right now compared to that when they were playing their worst back in week 11. All right, we can end on that tweet. Any any parting, any parting words before we go? Well, um, no, I, I don't. I, well, you know what? Um, what I'll say is this. This team coming into the Bears game felt so relaxed and so calm and so put together that you and I kind of – I don't know about if you felt it all the way, but I definitely felt going into that game that there was no way they were going to lose that game. Which game? The the Bears game. Um, I just felt it. Like, I turned to a few other writers and was like, there's no way they're losing this game. Like, it, it just – there was – if I get that feeling again, maybe my pick changes a little bit. But as of right now, I think the Saints are going to win this game in a close one. 
Yeah, this is one I'm waiting to make my pick until I have to turn in our pick story, which is tomorrow. So you guys will know by then. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I really enjoyed doing this. I, if you guys keep writing us comments and we'll do some more Twitter polls, we can do this more often, especially during the off season. But maybe the off season won't be starting just yet. We'll we'll know this week. We'll have our preview pod for you guys on Friday. Um, make sure you subscribe if you aren't already. And thanks for listening. <laughs>